Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. We are delighted and really honoured to be introducing David J. Getsey's keynote lecture today. David is the Gold Bell McComb Finn Distinguished Professor of Art History at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He writes about modern and contemporary art with an emphasis on queer and transgender methods for art and art history and on the histories of abstraction, sculpture and performance. His research has significantly advanced two key areas of art historical study, sculpture studies and queer art and the spaces in between. This resonates closely with our own research and teaching here in the Department of Art History, Curating and Visual Studies at Birmingham and hence this collaborative introduction. David's writings on sculpture have profoundly expanded the field of sculpture studies. Central to this is his work on the changing status of the human figure and his explorations of the distinct meanings generated by the viewer's encounter with sculpture. His books include Body Doubles, Sculpture in Britain, 1877 to 1905, Rodin, Sex and the Making of Modern Sculpture, and Abstract Bodies, 60s Sculpture in the Expanded Field of Gender. He has edited the volume Sculpture in the Pursuit of a Modern Ideal in Britain around 1880 to 1930, From Diversion to Subversion, Games, Play and 20th Century Art, and Scott Burton, Collected Writings on Art and Performance, 1965 to 1975. David's recent projects after the groundbreaking application of transgender studies to 1960s sculpture in abstract bodies have turned increasingly towards art histories shaped by dialogues with queer and transgender methods and histories. Uh, in 2016, he edited Queer, an anthology of artists' writings for the Whitechapel Gallery's Documents of Contemporary Art book series. His current projects focus on archive-based recoveries of genderqueer and queer performance art in 1970s New York City. His book, Queer Behaviour, Scott Burton's Performances of the 1970s, for which he was awarded the 2019 Senior Fellowship from the Daedalus Foundation, is forthcoming in 2022 from the University of Chicago Press. He's currently working on two new book projects. First, a monograph on Stephen Varbel and his genderqueer performance art in the 1970s. And it's based on the 2018 retrospective he curated for the Leslie Lohman Museum. And second, a book on performance in the proximity of Stonewall that discusses the ge geographic and social proximities between New York performance artists and the participants in the riot that started the modern LGBT rights movement. David's keynote lecture takes up uh, his recent work in dialogue with transgender studies and returns to 19th century art, where he began his academic career, uh, though here his focus is painting rather than sculpture. Uh, so just before I hand over to David, uh, just to say that we encourage you to respond with comments and questions. Uh, to do this, uh, please click the red Live Now button on the far left of your screen uh, and scroll down just below the abstract uh, and click on the questions icon below and you can fill in uh, questions there during the talk and we'll attend to them uh, at the end. The title of this keynote lecture is How to Teach Manet's Olympia After Transgender Studies. We are once again delighted and honoured to welcome David J. Getsley. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank the Association for Art History, uh, and in particular, um, Claire Davies and Claire Jones for their invitation and their support, and also Greg Salter for the introduction as well. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak to this assembly of those who teach, research, and write about art and its histories. So to begin, how to teach Manet's Olympia after transgender studies? That is a question I've continued to ask myself over the last few years. Manet's painting is often understood to be both a culmination and an inauguration of a narrative of art history that takes the nude as a central theme. It is one of the most commonly taught paintings in the history of art, and it is, it is an example that is expected to be known beyond the subfield of 19th century painting histories. Many of us have had to teach Manet's Olympia to students 
even if in just the context of a survey lecture. Today, I wanna to question some of the assumptions of how we ourselves have been taught to teach this painting and the genre of the nude that takes it as its anchor. As we all know from those survey lectures, this painting became notorious because of the scandal that erupted around its exhibition in 1865, two years after it was painted. Critics attacked this two-figure composition, layering insults on both of the women represented in it. At issue for the critics were the contradictory messages of the work, which remixed the codes of our historical traditions and of their painting techniques. This painting has been argued to have raised anxieties about class, sexuality, race, women's economic disenfranchisement, colonialist fantasies, racist nationalisms, masculine insecurities, and on and on and on. Both in 1865 and in the vast amounts of writing on Manet's Olympia, it has been the work's contradictions, collapsing dualisms, and strategic ambivalences that have fueled and maintained such a critical outpouring. Consequently, the painting has a starring role in the historiography of our field. As such, it is a privileged site at which to interrogate the field, its key terms, its biases, and its future. This is why I chose this painting for this talk and this audience with its wide range of specialties and scholarly perspectives. However, my primary interest is not really in this painting at all. Rather, it is an opening to discuss the ways we approach our history and how we teach it. I am not a Manet specialist, and I'm sure there are many in the audience who could readily stump me on a factual detail or outfox me in the twists and turns of this painting's scholarly afterlives. I'm a tourist in the field of Manet's studies, and I speak to you today as a teacher, like many others in the audience, who has had to account for this painting and to discuss the genre of the nude that is so central to the history of European art. We all have to talk about the nude at some point, and my overall concern is with how we characterize its historical complexities and interpretive capacities. So first, I will speak for a few minutes about my own trajectory, and then in the second half of this talk, I'm gonna go into some discussion of Manet's painting, the critical response, and a handful of key art historical texts about it. I will do this to offer an example of how we might give voice to the complexity and diversities of genders and embodiments in the archives and narratives of art history. In the past years, I've found it increasingly difficult to find the right words to talk about the nude. And I've heard from many colleagues who've also faced an increasing uncertainty. <clears throat> in the classroom, how do the conventional ways of talking about art history confront present day conversations? In particular, how do we talk about bodies and their genders? In the past few years, there's been an explosion of public attention to the long standing reality that genders are multiple and mutable, personhood is successive, and bodies are not simply or absolutely dimorphic. It is inadequate to discuss gender as either binary or static, these are not new developments. The only thing that's new is the public media attention to transgender lives and communities sparked by the more visible transgender activism of the last decades. This is not the first time that transgender concerns have made themselves visible in media or popular culture. This indeed has been happening for centuries. The presence of trans students in the classroom is also not new. It is also not the problem. Those other teachers with whom I've spoken about these new developments, by contrast, see the problem with how our history discusses and relies on the image of the new. Our trans students, our non-binary students, our intersex students, and their allies all see the body differently and more complexly than art history's one-to-one -one mapping of gender onto sex. Frankly, we must challenge the deep-seated presumption that the unclothed body is a natural and self-evident sign for a binary gender. When we project an image of an unclothed body onto a screen in a classroom, we tend to rush to classify it as either and only male or female. I can now see how I've done this myself in my earlier teaching and writings. 
And that assumption has been central to most of our history's narratives. Our students, or the readers of our articles, or our colleagues, or ourselves. However, all of these people may not be so quick to visually ca categorize. They may share that external organization of bodily traits with the image on the screen, but reject that classification as self-evidently male or female for one's own self and one's own body. How do we teach art history and the nude without foreclosing that student or that reader's own sense of self? Seeing someone's body, even in a state of exposure and scrutiny, does not tell us who they are or what gender they know themselves to be. This is an ethical stance that we must adopt in order to interrogate the ways in which we talk about bodies and people and their images. And let's remember art history traffics in nudes. They are central to the field self-definition. More so than perhaps any other discipline in the humanities, art historians talk a lot about naked bodies. Because of this, we must constantly refine the ways in which we, as teachers and as purveyors of the nude, account for those representations. How, in other words, do we teach and write about the nude with the recognition of the reality of transgender, non-binary, intersex, and other forms of gender and bodily particularity? This is a methodological issue that the discipline of art history must grapple with as it changes the ways we look at art, its histories, and its archives. My own questioning of how I teach art history in the nude has been informed by my participation in the interdisciplinary field of transgender studies. And it's the epistemological shift demanded by that field that underwrites my suggestions to you today. Even though this field is by now well established with its own journals, anthologies, and graduate tracks, there has been remarkably few inroads into art history. Literature and film studies, to say nothing of the social sciences, have been energized by the biopolitical questions and critiques that transgender studies poses. By contrast, art history has largely ignored the robust intellectual conversations happening in and through trans studies. That must change. One explanation for this avoidance is the unwarranted belief that transgender, non-binary, and intersex possibilities are limited to contemporary phenomena. Especially in the art historical narratives of the European tradition, we tend to focus on exemplary individual artists as the agents of those narratives. Consequently, the lack of visibly transgender artists in history is mistaken to be evidence for this belief that these are not appropriate questions for the past. But we need only think about the similar claims that have been made in the past, for instance, about why there have been no great women artists or why the narrative of art history has been predominantly white. Those ways of looking at the past have been overturned as well as a wealth of counter narratives unearthed. And the time has come to think differently about how transgender capacities are evident in and catalytic of art's longer histories. At the same time, I think art history has a great deal to contribute to transgender studies. Art history has developed nuanced and complex vocabularies for talking about bodily and other visual images and their proliferation of meanings and receptions. In 2015, I ventured one preliminary juncture between art history and transgender studies with my book on American abstract sculpture of the 1960s. In it, I asked how the dominant rhetoric of abstraction claimed to have purged references to the human figure, but was concurrently being defended in terms of its bodily evocations and engagements. In between non-figuration and bodily metaphor, new possibilities for seeing gender's multiplicity and transformability were proposed within the discourse of abstraction. Sometimes artists recoiled from the unruly capacities that their works addressed to others and other artists embraced the collapse of dualisms. That book was about non-trans artists and the way that their commitments to abstraction produced inadvertent instabilities in gender assignments. And my central concern was to demonstrate how we might gain a more complex account of the archive once we set aside the presumption that all genders are binary and static 
and that all bodies are absolutely dimorphic. If we assume instead complexity and multiplicity, then new ways of viewing the archive emerge, and I would argue more accurate ones at that. Now, that book was published six years ago, but I first started writing it in 2016. In the past 15 years since I started that research, the historical and theoretical literature on transgender studies has grown exponentially. Today, some of the most exciting work in transgender studies has uh, been focused on history and historical methodology. And in particular, a wealth of new research on the 19th century has emerged, further refuting any misconception that trans must be limited to a contemporary frame. The 19th century has been the focus of recent books, such as Riley Snorton's Black on Both Sides, Rachel Mesh's Before Trans, Jen Mannion's Female Husbands, and Hill Malatino's Queer Embodiment. They are exemplary of the new literature on the 19th century in Europe and America, and I take these books as a foundation for my questions for Manet's Olympia today. <clears throat> and I'd also just like to give a shout out to Leah Devon's forthcoming book, The Shape of Sex, which I'm eagerly anticipating, um, even though it's not about the 19th century. But we don't even just need these recent books. There are plenty of 19th century discussions of gender transformation and non-dimorphic bodies. Balzac's Sarrazine, Gautier's Mademoiselle de Maupin, Julia Ward Howe's The Hermaphrodite, and the memoir Herculean Barbat are just a few that I could name. While the term transgender may be relatively recent, the complexity it describes is not new. We can quibble about the use of that word, but that does not change the fact that there is long historical evidence that people have lived in genders not ascribed to them, that not all bodies are absolutely dimorphic, and that personhood is successive. I'm not going to repeat here the extensive proofs offered by authors such as Snorton or Mesh about the 19th century. Rather, I will simply assert it as axiomatic. The idea that gender can be changed was discussed and even sometimes accepted in the 19th century. It was also the lived experience of some people in the 19th century and before. Now, these recent books have brought to light the histories of trans and intersex subjects in the 19th century, but that is not the only task of transgender studies. We must also ask how the doctrine of binary static genders operates on all subjects when it breaks down and when it is used to reinforce other forms of discrimination. I write as a non-trans person about transgender studies. For instance, my book on abstraction reinterpreted the work of canonical artists who are also not trans, but whose archives, I argue, contain accounts of gender's multiplicity and mutability. I write with transgender studies about ostensibly non-trans artists and topics as a means to talk about the limits of a binary view of genders and bodies. And I believe in the importance of critiquing, critiquing episodes of the transphobic foreclosure of gender's complexity, as well as tracking the eruptions of transgender capacity at unexpected sites. I do not presume to speak from trans experience, and there will always be things that will be opaque or inaccessible for me to write about ethically. Rather than speak for trans subjects in history, I've chosen instead to put pressure on dominant narratives that have been built around non-trans subjects. I do this to show that within them, there is nevertheless widespread evidence and capacity for more open and mutable accounts of gender, even if inadvertently proposed. The discussion of Manet's Olympia that follows is an extension of this mode. <clears throat> Here again, I'm going to review a canonical episode in the history of art to demonstrate how its archive can be mined for accounts of gender's multiplicity and mutability. When we teach Manet's Olympia, that is, we have an opportunity to teach about genders and bodies in a way that addresses transgender histories and concerns. Now, I'm not gonna try and capture all the twists and turns of the Manet literature, but it's worth noting that a consistent theme in the writing about this painting from 1865 onwards has been about the ways in which it problematizes the stability of gender. As T.J. Clark thoroughly argued in his foundational essay on the painting, 
Manet vexed the expectations of looking at the nude, and he made viewers struggle with assigning conventional codes to the represented bodies in the painting. I'm indebted to his careful reading of the criticism of this work. At one point, he summarizes what confronted those critics in 1865. Quote, what writer saw instead was some kind of indeterminacy in the image, a body on a bed, evidently sexed and sexual, but whose appearance was hard to make out in any steady way and harder still to write about, unquote. As Clark so forcefully established, Olympia produced disruptions of expected conventions and dualisms. He remarked, quote, it's as if the painter welcomes disparity and makes a system of it, unquote. However, despite his careful attention to productive ambiguities, Clark also declared that Olympia's body was evidently sexed, but still producing an excess of that designation. <clears throat> The critics of 1865 capitalized on that excess. One recurring tactic was to challenge the humanity of Olympia and she and the attendant who shares the composition with her were compared to animals and objects. Other critics censured Manet for his choices and questioned the femininity of the two women in the picture. As Clark noted, quote, it is sometimes said, it was already said in 1865, that Olympia is not female at all, or only partly so. She is masculine or masculinized. She is boyish, aggressive, or androgynous. None of these words strikes me as the right one, but they all indicate quite well why the viewer is uncertain. It is because he cannot easily make Olympia a woman that he wants to make her a man. She has to be something less or more or otherwise aberrant. This seems to me wrongheaded. Surely, Olympia's sexual identity is not in doubt. It is how it belongs to her that is the problem." Unquote. Now, this is a telling paragraph, and it's one that can be recast through transgender studies. But let me be clear at the outset. My aim is not to critique Clark or his imp important analysis of the painting. Rather, I'm interested in putting pressure on the presumption of a binary gender in it which becomes a hindrance to recognizing other forms of complexity voiced by the critics of 1865. However shrill and vicious they were, were the critics simply wrongheaded? Since Olympia is evidently sexed in Clark's view, the critics are uh, understood as only creating mere fabulations and projections that he does not see borne out by the visual evidence of the nude body of Olympia in which her sexual identity is not in doubt, as he said. Now, I'm not interested here in defending the critics, but I do think it's important to challenge the assumption that their ascribing of masculinity, uh, masculinity to Olympia's body is self-evidently counterfactual, invalid, and incorrect. Well, why is the uncertainty produced by Manet's painting not itself part of the analysis, rather than being anchored to an assumption about what nude bodies must mean. Again, think of the scene of the classroom when we read these words, Olympia's sexual identity is not in doubt. What does the student or the reader who is assigned female at birth but knows themselves to be other than that assignment think? What of the dissonance between the assertion of certainty and the lived experience of complexity? Again, these are ethical questions for us as teachers, as well as methodological questions for us as historians. I'm going to return to them later in this talk, as there's much more to say about Manet and Olympia first. Now, I've started with Clark's essay because so many of us do. It is the text that I was told to turn to when I started to learn about Manet, about art history, and about how to teach this painting. My purpose here is not to undermine it, but rather to question how there's an internal debate in the essay, on the one hand, between the evidently sexed body, and on the other, Manet's relentless collapsing of dualities and his cultivation of ambiguities. <clears throat> Clark comes close to recognizing this at certain points. Later in the essay, he focused on the question of Olympia's red hair and its relationship to background and to the face seeing it as exemplary of the painting as a whole. 
In this, he enlists a series of binarisms to show how Manet disrupted them. Quote, the face and the hair cannot be made into one thing because they fail to obey the usual set of equations for sexual consistency. Equations which tell us what bodies are like and how the world is divided into male and female, hairy and smooth, resistant and yielding, closed and open, phallus and lack, aggressive and vulnerable, repressed and libidinous. These are equations the nude ought to provide." Unquote. Now here's the problem that Manet's painting poses, a disruption of what ought to be provided by this display of nakedness. This is an opportunity to criticize those assumptions about the nude as a sign for idealized gender, and we can do this um, only by not a priori foreclosing gender's complexity. It is also, as I will now discuss, a way to address the critics' assignments of masculinity to Olympia, seeing how they were not wrongheaded and misguided so much as they were strategic. They seized upon the theme of gender ambiguity and misgendered Olympia through conjuring offstage gender nonconformity and monstrosity. Critics in 1865 did recognize how Manet's painting attempted to disrupt the so-called natural order of assumed, uh, assumed of naked bodies, even if those critics flailed for precision or displaced their anxieties in their writing. Clark does an amazing job in recounting and analyzing the flood of negative criticism heaped on the painting um, in which gender was often an avenue of attack. For instance, uh, Olympia was called a grotesque made from white rubber. That is, she was called an imitation of a woman. There is throughout the criticism a management of appropriate gender, um, as when critics considered Olympia boyish or androgynous, um, and the sexism of these comments deploys a hierarchical gender binary to make the painting a joke. More directly, a negative and phobic stereotype of gender nonconformity was also used to account for this painting's unconventionality. Indeed, in 1865, one critic snidely called Manet original for painting the sign for the house of the bearded lady. Now, the bearded lady was one of the most visible and derided images of gender nonconformity in the 19th century. Manet uh, sorry, made into a spectacle to be mocked in circuses and sideshows, the bearded lady inspired lurid fascination because of the visible breakdown of binary traits assumed to be male or female. Clark asks of Olympia, quote, where is the lady's beard, where precisely is the lady's beard located, unquote. But this seems to me too literal a reading of this insult. Rather, this critic was not describing the image of the body he saw, but rather conjuring an image of monstrosity that his readers would understand. Um, other critics also engaged in misgendering as a means to attack this painting, and this also extended to Manet himself. In a well-known caricature by Bertal, uh, Olympia's name has been replaced uh, with a feminized version, Manette, uh, a feminized version of Manet's name, Manette. This caricature attacked both figures in the composition as a means to capture what it saw as the painting's transgressions. The rest of the title of this caricature translates to wife of the ebony, make, ebony worker or wife of the cabinet maker. This economical insult conflated a racist sneer at the blackness of the attendant with the assignment of class to Olympia. The caricaturist has covered the nudity of Olympia with a bouquet of flowers and removed any indication of breasts. In this re-imaging of Olympia, the signification of gender becomes unstable yet again. When we teach Manet's Olympia, we have an opportunity to talk about negative caricatures and stereotypes of gender nonconformity that were used to reinforce the narratives of appropriate gender. A transgender studies perspective on the use of monstrosity to represent trans people, which is a long running trope, is here relevant as a means of illuminating this thread through the critical discourse on the painting. Caricatures that misgendered their targets were common in the 19th century, and Olympia is not alone in having received this attack. 
What's important here is that, as with the vague implication of the bearded lady, there is an anxiety about the proper representation of bodies and genders that ends up becoming a cheap and easy route to mock or critique the works that the critics uh, choose to derive. For instance, another case from the Manet um, literature, here I show a later caricature about a different painting by Manet from the year before Olympia, his 1862 portrait of the dancer Lola de Valence. Randall, the caricaturist, altered the facial features of Manet's painting to imply masculinity, but he didn't leave it at that. He, his caption also uh, viciously reads, quote, neither man nor woman, but what can it be? I wonder, unquote. Now, such warnings of the collapse of gender binaries were not just something invented by the critics to attack Manet and his paintings. The complication of gender signification was also a central concern of Manet in the years he painted Olympia. Carol Armstrong, in her book Manet, Manette, which I will discuss more in a moment, has provided a wide-ranging analysis of how both critics and advocates saw Olympia as figuring Manet's artistic persona, placing the question of gender's mobility at its center. For instance, Emile Zola called Olympia, quote, the flesh and blood of the painter. She is the complete expression of his temperament. She contains the whole of him and contains nothing but him, unquote. Indeed, Manet's use of Victorine Muron as a model for Olympia and other paintings was, as Armstrong so thoroughly argued, centered on the demonstration of the variability of the meanings that one model could convey. Manet dressed her up and made it clear that he was doing so in many paintings. And in particular, the paintings of Muron are central to the investigations Manet made into costume and nudity in 1862 and 1863, and especially in the group of paintings of female identified sitters wearing clothing normally assigned to men. That is, the period in which Olympia was painted also saw pictures that relied on a discrepancy between the gender assumed of clothing and of the body who wore it. In particular, the 1862 Mademoiselle V in the costume of an espada features, features Victorine Neuron, the model for Olympia, dressed as a Spanish matador. Um, Sorry. Um, Armstrong has compellingly argued about this and related pictures that Manet sought to emphasize the conventionality of pictorial modes and received traditions, and his emphasis on costume and its discrepancies must be understood in relation to his remixing of received iconographies from old master paintings. As Armstrong noted about this painting, quote, what begins to become clear about this painting then is the close association between the play with pigment and the exploration of the ambiguities of identity, between the changeability of colors and the instability of a model's personality and physicality, between the declared literalness of paint and the enactedness of gender, professional role, um, and self-presentation of personhood in short, unquote. Now, I rely on Armstrong's deft analysis of the interrelations between Manet's paintings of this period and the ways in which it takes their proximity in the studio as the basis for an understanding of the accruing system that Manet developed for questioning received traditions. As this quote from Armstrong indicates, Manet's project was one of complicating assumptions about how we identified and viewed people in paintings and his play with cross-dressing was a key tactic in that disruptive aim. Armstrong later argues that in this painting, Murat is, um, quote, revealed as feminine by her masculine attire, unquote, pointing to the discrepancy caused by the assigned gender of the matador's costume. Now, we should not leave it at that, however, since such a view returns us to an expected binarism of gender in which there are only two options. By contrast, Armstrong's careful discussion leads us further than that, and it allows us to characterize Manet's disruption of convention as also proposing the arbitrariness of gender and the limits of binaries. The painting of Mademoiselle Vey is, after all, deeply ambiguous, and it requires us to import expectations to it 
from the title, from the exotic realm of the bull, bull ring, and from the other paintings of Miron by Manet that are in dialogue with this one. That is, from a transgender studies perspective, one could argue that Manet's painting, perhaps despite itself, articulates a performativity of gender that is above and beyond any expected binary reading of a body or of a piece of clothing. What has always been productive about Manet's strategies are their ambiguities and their collapsing of dualisms. And even at another point, Armstrong calls this, quote, a disordering of binary logic, unquote. If we look at another painting by, of Murat in masculine attire, this time a few years later, we can see how much a simple binary view might limit our understanding. The 1866 Pfeiffer, painted three years after Olympia and one year after its scandalous salon appearance, uh, blends the facial characteristics of Victorine Muron with the son of Manet's wife, Leon Leonhoff. Now, there are some in the literature who doubt the evidence or the relevance of the composite facial features of Muron and Leonhoff in the Pfeiffer. I will leave the parsing of that to the Manet specialists. But for my purposes here, it's significant that there could be debate about just whose face sits under the Pfeiffer's cap. The conversation about whether it is the face of a boy, of a woman, or both is significant, and it involves not just the ambiguity of this face, but also the resemblances to Manet's other paintings in which Murat or Leonhoff appear in ways that seem at first self-evidently gendered, as with the nakedness of Olympia. If we assume a binary reading of gender for these painted figures, we miss the productive conversation, both in our classrooms and in our research, uh, we miss the productive conversation about how non-ascribed and non-conforming genders are also part of our history's negotiations with how to paint people. The Pfeiffer can be understood through its visual agreements with other works to problematize the reading of gender based on surface appearance and to show just how contextual the assignment of gender can be in relation to other painted signs. The body of the Pfeiffer is not self-evidently gendered, nor is the face. It is only the clothing that leads us to assign gender to this figure. Manet cultivated such self-reflexivity in the reading of pictorial signs and iconographies and I would argue that these two paintings of Murat in gender ambiguous clothing articulate a skepticism about, or at least a troubling of, the visual assignment of gender. That is, while this work does not depict a trans subject, it raises the possibility of how transgender, gender non-conforming, or non-binary subjects might be represented or might, be, or might struggle to find their way into representation. The Olympia, was created in the context of Manet's experimentation with Murat as his favorite, favored model, shuttling roles from painting to painting. As Armstrong herself notes, quote, <clears throat> the paintings of Murat seem to call into question what kind of knowledge painting provides about a person, about either its author or its referent. Now, I now want to turn from Muron to discuss another painting by Manet made just before and in relationship to Olympia in which there is also a discrepancy between the models assigned gender and the clothings assigned gender. This work, Young Woman Reclining in Spanish Costume from 1862 to 1863, has sometimes been considered a prefiguration of Olympia its reclining figure, here clothed in Spanish garb, generally ascribed as male, parallels Olympia's composition, as does the presence of the pet, at the right of the picture. This painting, like Olympia, is also a rumination on the status of the nude, but rather than look back to Titian, as he would with Olympia, Manet based this work on Francesco de Goya's Clothed Maya, one of a pair of works created by Goya, one clothed and one nude. Again, a self-consciousness about the genre of the nude and the effects of clothing are at stake. Manet's painting was begun in 1862, but likely not completed until the spring of 1863, bringing it in close proximity to his work on Olympia. Importantly, the choice of clothing for his painting departs from Goya's, since Manet places his sitter in masculine attire. <clears throat> 
And again, here I rely on Armstrong's careful analysis, quote, the, young, the clothing that Manet chooses for this young woman is simultaneously masculine and body revealing, so that the indeterminacy of gender and the confusion between categories of dressed and undressed in the painting's use of Goya underline the denature and function of costuming, unquote. So when we look at the paintings that are linked to Olympia, whether through Muron as a model or through the compositional reference to the nude's traditions, we can see that Olympia is interwoven with Manet's investigations of how gender is signified and the, read and the reading of how, of how personhood is complicated. Olympia's difficulty is in part the product of Manet's attempts to make viewers self-reflexive about the nude, about the face, about what, and, and about what clothes mean. Much of what I've summarized here, of course, will not be news to the Manet scholars, and this web of cross-dressed and fused references is well understood. My claim, by contrast, is that we see the complex discourse of gender surrounding Manet's painting as an opportunity to discuss gender in a way that transformational and non-binary options are proposed. This opportunity is in the criticism of the painting, the art historical literature on the painting, and in Manet's intertextual associations between the paintings in the studio. To be clear, I am not arguing um, or proposing that we read the figure of Olympia as trans or non-binary. Rather, I'm arguing that the archive of this painting has been in part determined by accounts of gender's multiplicity, mobility, non-binarism, and transformability. A transgender capacity is proposed through Manet's interrogation of the nude's status as sign. Now, I imagine that there's some in the audience who might think that such a reading is anachronistic and that I'm projecting contemporary ideas onto past archives. But I wanna stress again, that debates about the complexities of genders and bodies are not new phenomena. They are part of the discourse of 19th century culture. Indeed, such contexts are closer to Manet's Olympia than have been previously recognized. The sitter of the young woman reclining in Spanish costume is believed to be the mistress of Manet's friend Nadar, the photographer and artist. Indeed, the painting is dedicated to Nadar. Gender ambiguity was something that Nadar had witnessed and a further context for these paintings and for Nadar and Manet's friendship and exchange are Nadar's um, photographs of the early 1860s. Nadar was also interested in what the surface revealed, and he was accomplished in photographic portraiture. He took Manet's portrait a number of times. However, Nadar was also confronted with the complexities of appearance. He had started as a medical student before becoming a pioneer of photographic technology, and it was through his contacts with the medical establishment that he came to be commissioned to take some of the first medical photographs in history. In 1861, the year before Manet painted a portrait of Nadar's mistress in men's clothing, Nadar had made the decision to copyright these photographs, something which he uh, did not do otherwise. These, however, were no ordinary portraits, and his unorthodox choice to copyright them and limit their display was because of their subject matter. He had taken them the year before, in 1860, and there are a series of nine photographs of an intersex person. They are believed to be the first photographs of an intersex person in the history of European art, and also um, the first or some of the first medical photographs in the history of, of European art. I will not show the complete photographs since they partake in a lurid and intrusive scrutiny of the sitter's body. Taking on the veneer of the objective or the scientific, these photographs focus on the genitals of the person. Nadar's photographs are the first in a long line of injurious and objectifying images of intersex people that treat them as unruly um, objects of curiosity or diagnosis. I do not have time to recap this history here, but we must remember that the visual representation of intersex and trans lives up to the end of the 20th century was dominated not by trans or intersex subject self-representations, but rather by the voyeuristic and diagnostic gaze of medical photography. These photographs, along with the science of sexology and gender that emerged around the study of intersex people, 
form the basis of our contemporary understandings of gender and personhood. And this has been thoroughly uh, discussed by scholars such as Elizabeth Rees, Suzanne Kessler, Anne Foster Sterling, and Hill Malatino. Nadar's photographs are the ignominious beginnings of this voyeuristic visual tradition. In the 1860s, the complexity of bodies, the confusion of genders, and the collapsing of binaries were not just the province of Manet's pictorial gambits or the critics' slurs. They were also the catalyzing conversations that would spawn modern sexology and the biopolitical management of gender. In the 1860s, gender was not as settled or as binary as we might assume. Yes, my comparison of Nadar's photographs of 1860 to his friend Manet's paintings of 1862 and 1863 is circumstantial, and I have no direct link to argue for the influence of one on the other. But nevertheless, I cannot see their social and temporal proximity as inconsequential. At the very least, it is evidence that there is a complex 19th century archive about gender's multiplicity and the non-dimorphism of human bodies, and it is coextensive with the history of 19th century art. Both Nadar and Manet, in their works of this decade, confronted gender ambiguity and produced images that complicated simple binary and dimorphic assumptions. Manet's Olympia, in other words, is surrounded by gender trouble. The plays with gender in this painting and its critical record, the fusions of the male and female physiognomies of the Pfeiffer, and the transphobic caricatures of Olympia and of Manet all gain new legibility when we see them in relation to transgender and intersex histories and experience. This most famous nude, in other words, offers itself as an occasion to talk about the complexities of the ways in which we rush to assign binary genders to bodies. This archive challenges us, like Manet did, to be precise about our own assumptions and to criticize the conventionality of signs. As I mentioned at the outset, I'm a tourist in Manet studies. These contexts that I brought to bear on the painting are no great archival finds, nor, with the exception of the discussion of Nadar's photographs, are they even very deeply buried in the literature. I've relied upon and redescribed some of the most complex and useful accounts of Manet's painting here by Clark and Armstrong, not to criticize them, but rather to show that there's an opportunity in the archive and in the literature to address the nude in a more complex and open way when we do not foreclose at the outset the possibility of genders, multiplicities, and mutabilities. We need that openness because some of our students and colleagues and ourselves will not rush to assume that a body like Olympia's is always a woman. Now, before concluding with some remarks about teaching, I do want to make two further points, um, which I will have to make regretfully brief. First, I do not believe, and indeed would stridently reject, the notion that a transgender studies perspective supplants or replaces a feminist one. Quite the opposite. An account of transgender history allows us to see the workings of misogyny and sexism in a new light. For instance, the vicious language used by critics to attack Olympia show how much a narrow view of femininity and of women was at issue with deviations from those norms being derided as monstrous, animal, or inhuman. A transgender studies perspective must work in consort with a feminist perspective in order to criticize and resist the patriarchal control of others' genders and bodies. Secondly, I have not talked much about the second sitter in Manet's painting, Lar, um, modeled by um, Lar. We don't know her last name. Some of the most exciting and bracing recent literature on the painting has been in the interrogation of race the legacies of slavery and of the racism in Manet's painting and in its reception. And here I'm thinking in particular of Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby and Denise Murel's recent works, which build upon formative earlier discussions of race by Griselda Pollock, Jennifer Devere Brody, and Lorraine O'Grady. Both in the 1865 criticism and in the subsequent literature, the reading of the nude has never been singular but always in relationship to the clothed black figure that shares Manet's composition. 
as has been thoroughly argued in the text that I've just cited, there is an invocation of colonialism and slavery and of the racist stereotyping of black French citizens, immigrants, and laborers in the 1850s and 1860s. Hortense Spillers has argued how the 19th, how 19th century slavery created narratives of gender rooted less in the body and its assigned gender binaries than in questions of ownership, slavery, and labor. And her writings have been foundational to transgender studies and its interrogation of the racialized mapping of genders onto bodies. Riley Snorton has extended Spiller's powerful analysis to examine how narratives of gender, transgender, and personhood in the 19th century were defined by race. To ask how the flesh, personhood, commerce, and ownership articulated in Manet's complex painting and in its troubling reception is to ask how genders are deemed appropriate to certain bodies and not others. Transgender studies can provide a critical and intersectional opportunity to talk about bodies, stereotypes, and the power wielded through and over them. There is much more to say about Manet's painting. And here, I've only drawn on a few widely cited sources in order to ask how and where assumptions about gender binaries have operated. I've gone into details about Manet and Olympia as an example of how one might look at art history and at art historical scholarship differently by refusing to assume that genders are static or binary. As I hope this example shows, this allows for a greater nuance in thinking through the archives and in the works themselves. The importance of this, I would argue, does not rest with Manet or this most debated painting. This is just one example, however canonical. Rather, my concern has been about teaching and narrating these episodes. As we retell the history of the nude, or the story of this painting, or the story of all painting, can we find opportunities to give voice to the reality of transgender and non-binary lives in those archives, in history, as well as in our audiences? I have attempted to provide some examples of how, when we teach this painting, we are able to make space in the classroom for conversations about transgender, non-binary, and intersex topics, even in such a canonical and well-trodden example, such as this one, um, and it's with its central place in the Art History Survey lecture. We must have these discussions, even if they're difficult, since the simplistic shorthand of the terminology of the female nude or the male nude as absolute or immediately apparent categories is ill-fitting and inadequate to the lived experiences in the classroom as well as inadequate to the archive. So this is how I've answered the question for myself about how to teach Manet's Olympia after transgender studies. And it's how I believe we might allow more of our students, our readers, our peers, ourselves, and our audiences to be able to see themselves in our history. Thank you for your attention. And we're just waiting for the host to come on. There we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Um, I'll just wait for Claire to arrive as well. Um, that was that was wonderful, and um, just as, as well as the kind of discussion of, uh, of Manet's Olympia, I was just um, really struck by um, the way you talked about our kind of the ethical questions faced by us as teachers of art history, and the way that intermingles with methods of doing art history uh, as well. And there was just so much um, to take on there uh, with that and to think about. So, so thank you so much. Um, I thought it was really powerful, just this kind of call to refuse the immediate kind of binary re binary readings of these, and 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 the kind of call to take this as an opportunity to think differently about these bodies. I thought was um, yeah a really wonderful, provocative talk. Thank you very much. Um, going to the chat now please everybody be really yeah it'll be really lovely to hear from both students and teachers
and practitioners and others who are in the audience today to really get um, a sense of your response to David's paper and any questions and queries you have for him as well. So please, again, go to the Live Now button, scroll down past the abstract of the paper to the questions section below and type in your questions. And then, Greg, are there any there yet? Uh, there aren't at the moment. Um, Christina Bradstreet from the National Gallery London um, saying that she's been absolutely blown away by your paper and to thank you for it, David. And Fiona Anderson at Newcastle. She's writing a question, but she says it will take her a moment. There's a lot to process. <laughs> and I, yeah, I quite see where you're coming from, Fiona. We need to kind of digest and pause um, in order to come through. Greg, do you want to? Um, well, I, I can't see any questions at the moment, so I think something's gone wrong with my question. Oh, you, have to keep ref you have to keep refreshing at the top. I am, but, oh, there we go. Ah. But, um, Alison Lee from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Thank you so much for this important work. My question is about when this work will be published and where. I'm so eager to teach your work and see students engage with it. And I quite agree that it'd be absolutely wonderful if you were going to be writing this up and that maybe we don't write enough or think enough about pedagogy in art history, actually. And I think it's been a real call for that. Well, thank you for that question. I, I just finished writing it yesterday, so it's not going to be published anywhere quite yet. But um, I hopefully will be turning it into uh, into something that will be published. But um, I, do, I just do want to say that you know one of the reasons I chose to do a talk about teaching was I I thought it was um, one of the, the great challenges is trying to figure out something that we might uh, from all of our different subfields might engage with and um, and since the survey lecture is often something that we have to do, I thought this would be a good way in. So, um, um, so, but it also it's I I tend to think a lot about teaching because again, you know, historical method and especially um, questions of method that um, you know that quickly become ethical questions. These are played out in the um, in the classroom, and indeed, much of what I've learned. Um, about um, about teaching, I've learned from my students. I know that's kind of a, a pat thing to say, but like it's because of all of the tough questions I, I got from really vocal students for the past twenty years that like keeps pushing me in these new directions. And so, when we get those questions, I think those are an opportunity to think about the kind of form of our teaching as well. Um, and so, th this is very much comes out of that um, those moments of uh, having a hiccup in the middle of the survey lecture when we, you know, when the conventional language breaks down. And so that was the core idea to, um, for the talk. Um, but there is a, a question that we've received here, a really important one, I think. I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, thank you. I've greatly enjoyed your lecture. And I think you're right about the potential to teach Olympia differently and to be more open to the nude figures, gender indeterminacy and the value of that to our students. How might one, however, deal with the negativity of the 1865 criticism in their use of gender indeterminacy as a weapon when trying to be trans inclusive in the classroom? Uh, I mean, it's an excellent question. I think whenever we're talking about the ways in which um, power operates and is used against people or categories of people, these are um, we necessarily replay some of the harm of that moment when we teach it in the present day and um but i don't think we can avoid teaching the um negative stereotypes and the use of the um of things like this these kind of like these slurs at the time i mean part of it and I mean, maybe this is naive on my part but part of it i think we help to diffuse the power of those slurs by thinking about how they can be understood in their historical complexity and thinking about how they are often the result of uh, you know of the anxieties around you know of the critics themselves but that's kind of a general way to respond to this more specifically i think um 
going into a talking about the kind of um, the slurs and the negativity is also a important to think, to characterize at the outset as being problematic. Um, and also to think about the ways in which the history itself is sometimes constituted only through such negative evidence. I mean, this is common in queer and trans history is that sometimes the only histories we have are these moments of, um, of legal or, um, or verbal or textual uh, insult. And if we completely avoid those, we would have no history to, um, to engage with. And so to think about that is a way of generating an anger at the archive, that's okay. An anger at the history, that is okay. But it's also a way of thinking about how the present day can be animated through those kind of those moments of critical engagement with what survives and why it survives. Um, but um, there, this still doesn't mean this is the same thing when we teach race in the classroom um, or you know, or sexist texts that they will continue to do the the harm that they were intended to do. And um, but again, if we completely avoid that harm, we uh, also avoid the opportunities to become stronger from surviving it. I mean, that's uh, I don't know if that's the uh, mm -hmm. best way to say it, but it it feels like the um, there's a there's a way of engaging with these negative elements that um, that sharpens students' critical attention to the present and their sense of what they can do today. Yeah, I was just thinking about that when you were saying that, that it also gives students and ourselves tools to resist these current day approaches as well. And people writing these thoughts today, these aren't obviously um, relegated to the past at all in any shape or form. Um, thank you. I've got Fiona's question now. Okay. Um, thinking about Lorraine O'Grady's incisive analysis of the work of how, quote, the female body sick in the West is not a unitary sign, and the ways in which Laura the maid embodies multiple ideas about women, it strikes me that this painting is also about how and when so many art historians who are white learn to ignore questions of race, racialization. In addition to teaching this work to and with trans and GNC students, how might trans studies help us to engage with this work when we teach students who are racialized and who experience racism when this discipline and their institutions and the world? Uh, it's an excellent question. I tried to um, gesture towards that at the end. And, um, you know, part of it, the talk was already too long. So I was trying to uh, make sure that we you know, I, I saw this as the beginning. I mean, first off, I would send everyone to um, um, to Darcy Grimaldo Grigsby's Art Bulletin article and to um, Denise Murrell's um, exhibition catalog that will um, that provide an amazing account of the blindnesses of art history with regard to weight to uh, uh, to race that are kind of built into this same historiography, but. Um, I mentioned Hortense Spillers, which I think is a is a an excellent way to be thinking about that. Maybe just to go in a little bit more about that. One of the um, the most powerful things about uh, Spillers' analysis, and in particular the article um, the, um, "Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe," is a ways in which the accounts of gender, the dominant accounts of gender, were. Um, already racialized, but also applied differently to bodies, again, not through questions of their sex characteristics, but in regard to ownership. And so one of the things that this does is it radically decenters the kind of biological um, definition of gender and places it within the realm of uh, capitalism and slavery. And this has been a foundational text for many in trans studies to be thinking differently about the ways in which gender is always already raced um, in our narratives of it. And it isn't tied to, and some of the, the kind of conventional ways of thinking about gender is it's somehow tied naturalistically to certain bodies. Uh, 
Spiller's account of the 19th century um, is so powerfully demonstrates that the question of biology is not one of the main factors in terms of gender, but ownership. And so thinking about that as a context, and again, Riley Snorton's book has done amazing things on the 19th century with some of these ideas from Spiller's. Thinking about that um, context allows one to really think deeply about how the critical reception of Manet's painting was the management of all of these anxieties precisely about, you know, not just class as Clark argues or gender um, as Armstrong argues or race as Grisby and, um, and Murrell argue, but all of them together. It's actually a, a, the management of bodies more, more generally. And so this is, um, there is a great opportunity for thinking about how these theoretical perspectives reinforce each other by um, questioning the assumptions that we bring to bodies, and especially the reading of personhood based on its exterior, which is another way to think about these things together. I hope I got to your question. I mean, I, I, there was like a, a second at the there was a second talk that was at one point going to be more, much more about these. Um, weaving these together, but uh, there's a lot to say about Manet's paintings. So. <laughs> Thank you, David. You're getting lots and lots of thanks in the comments, so hopefully we can send you these all these comments and questions uh, at the end, because I think this, this system allows, allows us to do that. Um, one of the, the questions is a mixture of thank you, um, uh, but uh, I'll read out the second part of that question. I'm afraid I, I can't see your name here, I'm very, I apologise. Uh, does your work in trans studies have implications for other subjects uh, beyond the nude uh, in our history? Um, yeah, that's what my book was about. <laughs> so, um, the Again, a, a trans studies perspective isn't something that's just merely like applied um, at certain iconographies or media or historical moments. It's rather a kind of thinking through some of the um, a, a, some of the uh, assumptions through which we look at archives, images, and each other. And so I think what I, what I tried to do in this, let me just, just kind of recapitulate again this talk, was to basically take a painting that a lot of people have to deal with, take two of the most um, important books on the painting and the critical archive about it, and just and demonstrate how much there, um, how much there is, uh, giving voice to questions of gender multiplicity and mutability that's actually having an internal debate with a presumption of a gender binary. And so by thinking of that, that, that kind of formula is also what I did with um, my work on abstraction, which again, I took artists who would who never even talked about in relationship to gender, let alone transgender, and show that the archive bears out a breaking down of the assumption of binaries. And that, um, and again, this is for me a way of contributing to transgender studies and thinking about its wider historical impact um, and implication for all archives and all subjects. And so the main, uh, you know, kind of lesson to take from either this talk or that other thing is to basically um, relook at um, your archive, the images, your if you're an artist, your practice, and and try and start from the assumption of complexity rather than starting from a binary, and that that's a kind of like a little um, uh, methodological virus that can uh, reorient other questions in very um, in many different fields, many different subfields, and so um, I'm particularly committed to thinking about how transgender and queer forms or visual traditions um, are not should not be limited to the representation of bodies because that's one of the ways in which they've been managed policed and surveilled so i'm much of my work though, is about thinking about how we can get beyond the nude or the body um, but here i thought it was just i wanted to kind of come full circle to return to the nude because it's the one that we assume there is no trouble about that at the outset. But um, is, I hope that answers the, the question a little. <laughs>
Thank you. I just wanted to comment in response as well that your use of the, uh, I liked the phrase transgender capacity um, mm. that you used it, and it just, with its connotations of kind of openness and expansion and, and growth felt particularly uh, powerful, you know, talking about archives and their, their potential mm. violence or limits. Thank you. That's, um, that, you know, that, um, Transgender capacity is is something that is the kind of methodological basis of the book, and so I've actually written about that terminology for if anyone's interested, um, to you know, in order to make it a usable method. So. There's actually been one question on bibliography whether there's any reading that could be circulated after this, actually, which I think is is interesting to help others in their teaching. Um, but on the question of the archive as well, there's a Christian from Kimberly Smith who asks, thank you so much for such a um, fascinating talk and for focusing on our ethical responsibilities um, as teachers. My students are often eager to talk about the intent of the artist and Manet was particularly um, good as a case study in thinking about this actually. If you were asked about the importance or non-importance of Manet's intentions, how might you respond? Or what? also, I suppose, how might we work if we really can't get a strong sense of the artist's intentions as well? So what a great question. I mean, I think this is, the, especially with Manet, there's so much writing that is ascribing intentionality. Um, well, one of the basic things that we we must think about when we engage with an artwork in its historical complexity is that we need to track it from its conception to its realization to its reception. Those three episodes in the life of every um, artwork are interesting, and they are they do not map up or map onto each other exactly. Sometimes the intent is thwarted by materiality or, um, or the economic conditions that allow that intent to be realized. What, you know, is there an exhibition contact? And then in turn, the reception of uh, an artwork after it's realized is also equally unruly because it involves all these other subjects looking for themselves in someone else's artwork. And so intent is always one part, an important part, but one part of the, the kind of life cycle of every artwork. When we talk about um, a painting like Manet's Olympia, the one thing that I think everyone in the Manet literature agrees upon is that his intent was to make people question just what it is they thought they were seeing um, or what they assumed they knew about how painting worked, how, um, you know, how iconographies work and so on. So that's something that can be characterized. And again, we, we could talk about the, you know, his replaying of these compositions from old master painting and so on. And you can talk about that intent, but then say, what are some of the other effects of that intent? And what are the ways in which that intention is worked out in different ways that we might characterize things from, the, from a present day perspective um, differently than he might have? That seems all, um, um, all okay. And again, for, especially in the kind of work that I try to do is that um, intentionality is a crucial component of how we understand how an artwork comes to be in the world, but it cannot be a limit to the meanings of it once it is operating out into the world. Um, that is, you know, this, that's something that again, I'm, uh, I, I think kind of helps us is to kind of understand these things are intention. So Manet may never have intended to, um, to do what I, you know, the way I just read it, but he definitely was trying to complicate questions of gender and the vocabulary of the nude. You know, I mean, because he's using um, male costumes for um, female identified sitters. So you can, there's definitely places where that intent can be anchored, but then start thinking more broadly. And just for, with regard to the first question of like what a bibliography would be, um, a little self-promotion here. I'm happy to say that um, in the fall, um, I collaborated with um, uh, another scholar, Che Gossett, to develop a, a syllabus for um, transgender and non-binary methods for art and art history. And so that'll be published in Art Journal 
um, in its uh, the fall or winter uh, issue. So, and that's um, that will have you know it, that tends to focus more on contemporary, but it will um, have many of the key methodological uh, questions. And also, we decided to break it up into categories that are useful in thinking about. Um, how to teach and engage with our history. So we have a section on form and materiality, representation, the built environment, and so on. So it should be something that will be useful for those who teach art and art history. So yeah, stay tuned. I think, um, unfortunately, that there are many, many more questions, but we have to um, wrap things up now because we have to allow the association for art history staff to go home uh, and <laughs> their office uh, and things uh, but thank you so much uh, david again for uh, such a wonderful keynote and um it's really been really positive oh. and, and thoughtfully received uh, by people today so um thank you so much well thank you Connor and greg and thank you everyone in the audience who i can't see who you are thank you for coming and for your attention um and uh, let's keep talking about this. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.